uh, level of that block is going to be. Because of that layer of abstraction, there's a lot of neat functionalities that can be uh, harnessed with that the tiered storage, the thin provisioning, the data instant replay, remote instant replay, and so forth. And we'll talk more about that. But what this is showing is we stride all of our data across all the spindles in your array. There's no more carving out these five disks for this RAID 5, can you map it up to these uh, host, host or hosts in the cluster, and I'm going to take these two disks, carve them out RAID 10, and get it over here. You don't have to do that anymore. All the data for all the volumes, with lungs, what we call volumes, are striped across all the disks in the array. So what does that get you? Even in a traditional shared storage, you're consolidating that, you still had over and under utilization, right? With this, there's no over and under utilization. You don't have to have a crystal ball anymore to, to decide how many disks, what rate type, how fast should that disk be. You're also leveraging all of the IOPS for all of the disks in your environment. If you have to carve out five disks, that application hanging off that LUN only gets the IOPS for those five disks. Why can't it have the IOPS as it needs them from the entire array? So, and these are some of the, okay, so I'm going to talk email that's never going to be read again. Where does that need to reside in the array? Does it need to be on your uh, more expensive fast disk? Or can it go down to the cheap and deep disk? So the metadata is truly the, the secret sauce to the compelling solution. I'm going to talk on the next slide about the automation how we are able to uh, tiered storage, move data between tiers or speeds of disk. Uh, and it's all offline, you know, it's not offline, it's a setting, forget it, type technology. It's not something that your storage administrators have to babysit. And finally, thin provisioning, and I will talk a little bit more about that one. Uh, on the thin provisioning, uh, if you take nothing away, take this away, nothing else away, 100% of our customers utilize thin provisioning. You can't turn it off. In fact, when your applications try to write zeros, we tell it, the application, yeah, we wrote you zeros, and we don't. Everything is thin provisioning. You buy the solution to leverage thin provisioning. We're not going to come back to you the day after the sale and say, uh, you probably shouldn't run your critical applications on the thin provisioning uh, volumes. Everything is thin provisioning. Okay, so the tiered storage. Some good eye candy on how everything starts out with your fastest. All rights come in, tier one will be the fastest disk in your solution, RAID 10. Right. As soon as that, uh, those blocks are frozen in time, snapshot, they're effectively read only, right? We're immediately going to mark those to restrike them to write RAID 5.5. So you've got an almost immediate uh, savings on capacity utilization just because we froze that data. It doesn't need to be RAID 10 anymore. From there, it's all based on activity. How often is that block accessed, if ever? If it's not, relative to all the other blocks in the environment, we're going to start progressing it down to the less expensive, more cost-effective, what I call the cheaper and deeper disk, all the way down to the 2 terabyte, soon to be 3 terabyte, 7200 speed disks. Again, it's a set of forget technology. You don't have to babysit it. It's at the block level, so it's very granular. It doesn't matter if it's out of a file of, of uh, unstructured data or if it's a block out of a SQL Oracle or Exchange database. Once that block goes inactive, down it goes. So some of the questions that I hear for tiered storage is, well, what if that data starts being highly active, highly used again? Okay, well, going back to the beginning, all writes are written fast disk rate 10. So your write traffic has, this has no impact on that. That's always going to go to fast disk. And then based on the life of that written block, where is it going to go from there? The other thing is, while it's a set of good technology, you don't have to babysit it, you still have complete control over it. I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, anybody in education? Education, I think. Okay. So you've got application servers dedicated to registration, right? They're thrashed three times a year for two weeks or so, give or take. All right. So through the course of the, the semester, those registration servers aren't being used. All that data is going to progress down. But you know, come beginning of the semester, registration time, you're going to have X thousand number of students all at the same time hitting those application servers. You can go in, and this is non-disruptive. You don't have to talk around with your host at all. You can go in and tell those volumes, I need you back up in Tier 1. All right? So and it'll automatically progress that data back up to Tier 1. You go through your two weeks of registration. You move it back to the storage pro profile that leverages all tiers of storage, and it moves it back down. 
right? And you can script that you know, based on time date stamps, so you don't have to babysit it again, you, so that it'll automatically move it. So. All right, so this is speaking to the scalability, this slide is speaking to the scalability of compelling solution. We scale both up and out. So as you, you can add additional disk, all patches, maintenance, upgrades are non-disruptive. Of course, you're still going to do them during a the maintenance window due diligence, but you don't have to mess around with your applications and your host while you're doing this. You can add disk, you can add anything in a cluster environment. Once you reach the physical limitations of x86 architecture and SAS protocol and so forth, you can scale out into multiple arrays, but you still get to manage it from a single pane of glass. All right, so this slide is speaking to the perpetual license. I spoke to it at the beginning. This is a big one. Once you buy your license, I said I was going to say it again. Once you buy your licensing with the SAN, with the SAN solution, you, never, you own those licenses for the life of your enterprise. They are not tied to the hardware. What does that mean? Over time, as technologies improve, we've got SAS, we've got FCOE, we've got faster controllers with all PCIe slots now. As your hardware ages, you can refresh your hardware modularly, you know, find what you need. You need more fast disk, you need more cheap and deep disk, you need uh, better controllers leveraging new technologies. You can refresh those as needed, and we're not going to charge you for your licensing. It's a very different story with the competitor who, as they bring in new technologies, oh, you want that 251st disk? Oh, you want to use FCOE? Well, you got to buy our Model 2000. And oh, by the way, you have to repurchase all of your software licensing. And oh, by the way, in this model, the software licensing is two and a half times the cost of the software licensing that you purchased previously. Not with compelling. We have one model. All right? We have different series of controllers and so forth as they've gotten better. But we have customers who bought our first controller head units in 2004 all right, that are still today running our latest rev of code. All right? So continuous data, data availability. Uh, the big takeaways here are there's no pre-allocation of space. You get to put away your crystal ball again. You don't have to worry about how much space do I need to set aside for my replays, my deltas that I experience as I'm taking snapshots uh, based on how I'm retaining those snapshots. So just kind of going around the wheel here, continuous snapshots, we have asynchronous and synchronous available. You can take for async. You can take snaps as early and as often as you need, and you can retain them for as long as you need. We have no limitation on the number of snaps that you uh, can manage. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of these given the time, uh, but the big ones on this, all the best recovery, bring that one up. Uh, re again, recovering that replay, mapping it up to your host so that you have recoverable data is very, very quick. A couple of clicks through the GUI interface and you're done. What's great about this also is with that same license to do remote uh, replication of those snaps, uh, you can actually mount those on the DR side very quickly if you got a development group. Hey, I need three copies of the production environment so that I can do my development testing and staging. You don't have to copy all that data somewhere. You can actually leverage mounting the replays, map those up to your development servers, let them you know, use them, and when they're done with them, tear them down in just a handful of clicks, very quick. BDI support is basically saying uh, we have SSD capability for your boot storms as well. Uh, this is speaking to the thin write when we're writing, or I'm sorry, when we're replicating our data to another component array for DR. Uh, we don't write uh, the zeros once it's seeded, we're only sending the deltas across. And again, big takeaway, six clicks in the GUI interface to set up a replication stream. You can do uh, mesh, you know, multi-hop, replicate it here, and replicate it here, uh, anything that you need to do. GoPilot support is the compelling brand of their support services. And uh, early in the year when Michael Dell was looking at acquiring compelling, uh, he came back after the uh, acquisition and said there was two reasons why I bought Compelling. First, the technology. They are the thought leaders in this industry. Second was Copilot. 
He actually sat in the cube with Copilot Tech uh, with headset on and actually listened in live on some of the calls. You can only imagine the uh, sweat that was beating on that tech that day. Uh, so, but that was one of the reasons he said that he was so impressed with the Copilot model uh, of support that he was uh, he is going to be looking for ways to envelop that into uh, the Dell uh, company as a whole. Ninety-eight percent satisfaction rate. Your whole times are going to be measured in minutes. All right. All of the Copilot support staff are in Minnesota, All right, so English is the first language. It's not a situation where you're going to have to deal with, eh, I'm the tier one, I'm not sure, so I'm going to have to, have a, I'm going to, have to escalate this, we'll get a call back in a couple hours. It's not the way it works. He's actually going to stick his head up, hey Frank, come help me with this issue. They're going to fix it very quickly. All right, so I'm going to switch over to that up there. Okay. So real quick, how much time do I have? Five minutes? Okay, perfect. All right, so that's basically the nuts and bolts, the architecture, a little bit of licensing on the compelling solution. I'm actually, actually changing gears. I'm going to go back into my customer, when I was a customer role. Uh, this is really just a you know, walking testimonial. I'm not saying this because I'm getting paid if you buy from the company. I'm saying this because I believe in this product because I've been using it for a lot of years. It really works well. Now I've, uh, I've genericized this, I'm, you know, for, I don't want to, I, I don't need to mention my previous company, but you guys can probably put some link in and really trying to figure out who it is. Anyway, I was working for a cloud computing company. We had uh, three data centers, Evansville, Louisville, and Indianapolis. I went in and inherited an S. I just I shouldn't have said that. I went in and inherited a competitive solution, and uh, I immediately saw a real good fit for compelling into this, into this uh, organization. So uh, cloud services, they were uh, using uh, the Cisco shop. Uh, we implemented uh, Nexus technology into that while I was there. And they were mostly working in the application space in Citrix. So this was our mesh. We had three data centers. Uh, the situation uh, was we were looking at an overhaul that had a lot of uh, antiquated legacy uh, equipment uh, that was not compelling, not Cisco. Uh, so Again, we had uh, three data centers, and what were some of the reasons that I was in? So it was interesting that um, when I was, you know, my roots were in systems administration, and it was my responsibility to uh, present to the board or to the C levels. You know, this is the solution. This is the cost. Here's the TCO. This is why this is why it's right for our business. Um, as I uh, went into management and was in that decision-making position, it flip-flopped. Especially when I was going into a new operation and inheriting an engineering team, I had to convince them that this was the right solution because they were the ones who were going to be turning the screws every day, and I needed their buy-in. I wanted them to believe in what I was bringing in. Uh, so uh, how I was able to very easily sell to my staff the compelling solution was, one, it was cost, it was cost competitive, cost-effective solution, especially when you look at the TCO from never having to buy your license again, even when you refresh your hardware. The tiered storage was perfect for cloud, cloud services. We didn't have to worry about, Mr. Customer, how often you're going to access your data. Fast disk take rate, rate 10, and just as it progresses down, it progresses down. Very intuitive GUI. Uh, single point of, single uh, pane of glass for managing multiple arrays, and then also uh, co-pilot support. Also, the live volume worked very well. This is a technology that Compellent has integrated, uh, I guess it started about three years ago, maybe two years ago. Live volume is great for those companies who need a lot of nines in their high availability. All right. What live volume is allowing for is planned migrations. So if you cannot, have, you cannot disrupt your applications, but you need to move this blob of storage from here to here, even across data centers. We were running live volume between Evansville and Louisville. Had a good thick pipe, you know, we need less than 20 millisecond latency, but we were able to actually on the fly, move our customers' applications between data centers as needed. It's planned outages, so for your uh, maintenance, you've got you know everything that we do for patches, maintenance, upgrades is non-disruptive. But we all know the reality: you still got to do it during a maintenance window. Sneezing in the data center is imposing a risk, right? So we need to move these applications over to this other array. We'll do our work, and then we can move them back. It also helps for load balancing, which uh, lends itself well to the single pane of glass. You don't have to worry about, hey, I got my two arrays, I'm managing them from a single pane of glass, but where should I put this load, you know, because I want to make sure I load balance these. Live volume does that for you. 
So this was a, uh, a strong uh, factor in our decision at uh, the cloud services company. Uh, a little eye like candy on uh, the fiscal aspects of it and on how easy this is to see. Again, we have three data centers, uh, Evansville and Louisville, who are hot and hot, and then we were using Henry uh, just to get uh, all of our customers' rep data replicated out to get it off the river, uh, you know, away from the ice storms down there. Uh, so we had compelled solutions in all three. We were running the Nexus uh, 5000s, and uh, we were also using the Cisco uh, UCS uh, 200s, R200s, and 250s. And that's the end of the slide. So, any questions, comments, donations? <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you.